It is a very common misconception amongst people that the night sky has been explored in its entirety by the great professional space observatories like James Webb, Hubble, NASA, ESA. People think there is nothing left for the average person to go out and discover in space, but this couldn't be further from the truth. In fact, there is so much left to be found that one could literally point a telescope at random spots in the sky and discover entirely new unknown nebula. And that's exactly what me and my friend recently did. This is the story of the discovery of Falls Fernandez 1, the Pistachio Nebula. My name is Bray. I'm a full-time astrophotographer living in the United States. My goal is to capture unique views of deep space using my own telescopes and cameras and to share these views that I capture with the world. And for this nebula discovery, I teamed up with my friend Chester Hall Fernandez. My name is Chester Hall Fernandez, and I am an astrophotographer from New Zealand. Yep, still definitely in school, um, studying engineering, so third year of my four years degree, and I'm studying mechatronics. So that's the combination of mechanical and electrical, a little bit of software, mix it all together and you get mechatronics. What are you into photography-wise? Um, I do a little bit of everything, so landscape, aurora, and the usual deep space. In astrophotography, we use tracking mounts, telescopes, and cameras to take many long exposures of nebula and deep sky objects, and we stack these long exposures together to reveal faint details. Many of the things that we photograph in space are composed of emission line gases. These gases glow at very specific colors, such as hydrogen alpha and oxygen 3. These objects that create these emission line gases usually form as the result of very violent events. For example, when a massive star dies, it explodes and casts out its layers into what's known as a supernova remnant. When a slightly lower mass star dies, it sheds its outer layers more gently out into space and creates a circular or ringed nebula called a planetary nebula. The details hidden within these gases are actually not well understood in the context of the whole night sky. So one can go searching in these different gas wavelengths and often encounter nebula that were totally unknown. As long as you're willing to waste time looking where no one else has taken photos of before, you have the chance to run into something exciting and new. And that's exactly what me and my friend did. What inspired you to just put your camera lens in a random spot? <laughs> and why did you pick that spot? Was it like divine intervention? Absolutely. Did God tell you it would be yeah. there? <laughs> yeah. I, I, I dreamt it and I was like, right there. I, I don't know, I just kind of, I saw your work and I saw Marcel's work. And I was like, damn, that sounds really cool. So I had the opportunity to spend some time at work at my the observatory I was working at doing this sort of search and kind of figuring out what spot I wanted to point it in was mostly just kind of a, a where, where in the Milky Way, but like where is somewhere somewhere that people don't shoot. So um, I ended up kind of pointing my Samyang 135 at this spot, at this spot just uh, what, north of the Dragons of Aura. So kind of really in the middle of nowhere. So you might have this expectation that in order to discover a new nebula, you need some kind of huge giant telescope that's super ultra expensive and that's actually really not the case. Instead of using huge large telescopes, we most commonly use cheap camera lenses combined with cooled astronomy cameras and narrowband filters to go out and explore the sky for new nebula. In particular, the holy grail of these lenses that us astrophotographers use is the Rockinon 135 F2 camera lens. And using some special adapters, we can meld this into our telescope setups to create a system that's capable of surveying large parts of the night sky quickly for faint nebula. What is your rig that you use to look for stuff? I use a EQ6R, a Samyang 135, and a QHY268M. So having a monochrome camera is pretty important for this sort of work because then you can get the, the sensitive full resolution image. And the Samyang 135 is an excellent wide field telescope that is ridiculously fast so i can yeah sh i shoot at f 2.8 when i do narrowband images and i can usually get a clean enough image to like tell that there's a new nebula there within you know like four or five hours which is half a night really at the moment now this also begs the question many people may expect that the nebula that we are in search for are very small and how could a tiny little camera lens pick out these objects in the night sky 
and this is also untrue. In fact, most of the nebula are quite large in size. Many of the professional observatories around the world have very large telescopes that aren't really well equipped to looking at nebula of these scale, so they usually will completely miss them while imaging other objects. It requires a very particular combination of a wide field of view and a fast lens to pick up these very large faint objects in the night sky. Me and my friend Chester both use nearly identical setups using the same camera lens to do this function. It was a pretty chaotic night actually because I was trying to do four panels and it was April so we probably had about seven hours of darkness but then also at the same time we had to do, I had to do the, bl uh, the blue channel for the continuum subtraction and I don't have any autofocus on my Samyang so I had to um, manually focus between each one. But because I wanted to optimize the amount of time I had, I started the narrowband um, before it got fully dark. So it went like narrowband and then refocus and then do the continuum subtraction and then refocus back onto the narrowband and then do the rest of the panels. And then it was just, a, it was a mess. We got there in the end. <laughs> that uh, that does sound like a mess. It's really chaotic. Did yeah. you have that all scheduled in Nina in advance, or are you like no, busting out the laptop? The laptop, yep. So after more careful analysis of Chester's survey images, we encountered a very particular blob. After doing some analysis of this probable nebula, we identified a very hot star located in the core of this small blob. And this was kind of a giveaway that there is something more interesting going on here that requires a bit more research. So in the process of nebula discovery, one of the questions I get most from people is how do you know that the thing that you found is new? So the process of actually determining whether or not you have found a new nebula is relatively simple depending on the type of nebula you have at hand. If you have a reflection nebula, it can be quite difficult to determine if it's new. If you have a supernova remnant or planetary nebula candidate, it is actually relatively straightforward to determine if your object is known or not. The great thing is that astronomers love to make catalogs and lists to list out things in space, and you can actually access these catalogs and determine whether or not something is known or not, since every object that is known is contained within the catalog. So using the celestial coordinate system, we can plug in any set of coordinates to these websites and with a quick cursory glance, we can determine if this object is registered or known about. So after maybe a 15 or 20 minute check across three or four different catalogs, we can have a fairly certain idea of whether or not our nebula is known or not. And this is what happened with this blob that we identified. It turned out to have no apparent registration in any catalog and a nice hot star located centrally in the object. And this is a really good sign to take more photos. So after we've got a possible nebula, we've determined that it's new. We determined that it's probably going to be pretty good. The problem is taking a photo of it. Now, when it comes to things that haven't been seen before, typically they're very difficult to capture photos of. If they were bright and easy to see, then they would be known already. So they usually require tons of long exposure. Chester and I had a problem. Me living in the USA, I can't actually see the nebula from where I live because I live in the Northern Hemisphere and this nebula is in the South. The weather in New Zealand was really bad uh, for the last couple months. So we needed a way to capture a lot of exposure time on this object to show its existence. Now, luckily, a couple months prior, I actually just finished the construction of my Namibia telescope setup, which is a remote observatory located in the desert in Namibia. And I built this out with the explicit purpose of searching for new nebula in the night sky. And with my small refractor located at the observatory, it was the perfect system for going out and photographing this object, given that the weather there is so good for astronomy. In total, we spent about 100 hours photographing this object split between two different telescope systems, my camera lens and my 85 millimeter refractor. This is equivalent to spending about five days in pure darkness, just exposing one single photograph. This is a ton of exposure time in today's astrophotography. And with every hour of exposure, new details began to become apparent to us. And the nebula that revealed itself was pretty far beyond even my own expectations for what would be there. What you're looking at now is the finished photograph for Fall Fur 1. Now, when you discover a planetary nebula, it inherits your last name 
or the last name of all the people who discovered it. So me being Bray Falls and my friend Chester Hall Fernandez, it adopted both of our last names, Falls and Fernandez being Fall for and the number one for our first joint discovery of a planetary nebula. So when you discover your nebula, it inherits this official name, taking your last names, but you as the discoverer get the opportunity to give it a colloquial name. And for this, we have chosen the Pistachio Nebula because this thing just kind of looks like a weird amorphous blob and we couldn't think of anything that looked more similar to it than a pistachio nut. Do we know who came up with the pistachio name or is that just like we both thought of it independently? I think I think you mentioned it and I was like, oh, that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> There's not much to it really. Um, I, I like all these nebulas. It's just kind of like blob in space. The blob nebula doesn't really like roll off the tongue, so. No, it doesn't. It's uh, I always have, imagine myself as like the the silly guy who would give something a stupid name and then at the last second i'm like i need to take this work seriously because this is serious and then i give it a real okay yeah. name yeah but inside i just want to call it something stupid yeah. and yeah. this time i feel like i've stricken a balance between stupid and passively okay i feel like pistachios or like as far as you know these things are named it's pretty it seems pretty like on par you got like the robin egg nebula and like the running chicken and yeah it's farm-esque it's in the yeah. universe of things that people could name something after yeah yeah so i guess it works it nothing nothing can be worse than the running chicken nebula so there you go this is the first nebula we've given a silly name uh not much is known about the pistachio nebula given that it is very recently discovered but we can tell you a couple things about it based on what we know about the star located at its core. The Pistachio Nebula is about 50,000 light years away, which is quite distant from Earth. At its core is a very hot blue star with a temperature of 22,000 Kelvin. We don't know exactly what type of star this is. This could be a true white dwarf. This could be a hot subdwarf. Not much will be known until further study in spectroscopy is done of the nebula, and I'm not sure when that's going to happen. But this temperature of star is certainly sufficient to ionize these surrounding gases. In particular, the O3 blue emission is quite bright in this nebula. In fact, it's dominant. We were both pretty surprised with how bright it was. Um, it showed up, showed up in the RGB data with like 40 minutes or whatever of integration. Um, in the starless, it looks like a kind of halo-y kind of blue blob that it just looked like you know star halo but it was probably the nebula under there so yeah, we're both we're pretty surprised with how like it wasn't found before because it's not faint it's faint but it's not like you know, yeah that's that's how they go it's like it's not that faint but it's kind of faint but it's like there's one tiny part of it yeah <laughs> That's super obviously there and it's really bright, but unless you actually went and looked at it, you'd be like, this is a glitch on the DSS2 plate. Scroll yep. past, you yep. would never know. It's a hindsight is 2020 moment. Given the angle subtended by this object in the sky of about 10 by 20 arc minutes, and given that its distance to the star is about 50,000 light years, we can estimate that this nebula physically spans about 290 light years of space, which is about 1.7 quadrillion miles. Can you talk about editing the photo? Like, was it normal, like editing a typical astro photo, or is it like a pain in the butt experience? I, I don't know how you do it for basically exclusively all of your photos. It's such a, it feels like a crime, what you have to do to the data to make it presentable. It's just, you just like orbital strike it in terms of the denoise and just nuke it to like nothing. It's, it was different. Um, but you got to do it. Otherwise you end up with like either a really faint image that no one really cares about or it's noisy and ugly. So yeah, spend 800 hours or commit dark arts to your image <laughs> is yeah. uh, the two options at hand. It's kind of crazy how not easy it is, but like didn't take me that long you know i don't have like the most insane equipment ever i mean okay to be fair i spent or oh, how many nights through four or five night clear nights in like the best guys in the country effectively looking at nothing so that's like and it's not i'm not remote so it's a it's a commitment and it's a, like a i might i maybe get 20 nights a year 
of of imaging like that. It's a big commitment doing something like that bold, I guess, but I'm glad it worked out. I was be kind of upset. Well, we hope you enjoyed this video about the discovery of the Pistachio Nebula, but the story doesn't actually end with the Pistachio Nebula, because while we were busy looking at this object, we came across something truly incredible right next door. It's called the Lightning Bolt Nebula, and we'll talk about this in the next video.